This is the life I've chosen. All I can do now is give it all I've got. These were some of the last few words that Suguru Geto said to Gojo in the final episode of the Hidden Inventory arc of JJK. It was the moment that completed Geto's gradual descent into darkness that had begun the moment he witnessed the end of Riko Amanai firsthand, capping off what I believe is one of the more masterfully told villain origin stories that I have ever experienced as a manga reader. It was a short character arc, spanning just two episodes in the anime and a few chapters in the manga, but in in that short time diving into Ghetto's psyche, we witnessed someone go from a kind-hearted and happy teenager to a cold-hearted cult leader capable of wiping out an entire village of innocent people violently without a shred of remorse. As a pretty big fan of well-written villains, it was something that I really appreciated when I first read the manga. That being said, I was completely blown away by how the anime adapted Ghetto's transformation into a monster and made me seriously appreciate him as a character all over again. It reminded me that the most truly impactful villains in any story are the ones where you can almost sympathize with their beliefs and goals, even if that technically means rooting for a guy that's looking to wipe out 99% of the human race. That's what motivated me to make this video, where I want to take some time to break down this depressing period in Ghetto's life that helped shape him into the evil sorcerer we see later on in the story. So by the end, my goal is to give you guys a full understanding of Ghetto's character arc and why I truly believe he's one of the most beautifully complex villains in manga, period. So with that being said, let's get into it. Since I'm assuming that most of you watching this video have already either read the manga or are caught up with the anime, I'm not going to spend much time breaking down the actual events of the Hidden Inventory arc, more so how these events affected Ghetto in particular as they were happening. When we first meet Ghetto as a teenager, he comes off as a likable and kind-hearted person, fully aware of his role as a special grade jujitsu sorcerer. In his eyes, the strong like him and Gojo had a duty to protect the weak from curses since they don't have the strength to protect themselves. Why yeah, so man. weak? So weak. Essentially, his views were that of any typical shonen protagonist where he felt a moral obligation to protect the less fortunate from the evils of the world around them. This is the Whee! gift and later on the curse that he felt strong jujitsu sorcerers had. He explained it pretty perfectly himself when he has his face off with Gojo while they're playing basketball. He strongly disagreed with Gojo's views that the strong shouldn't be bothered with the issues of the weak and saw their duty of protecting non-sorcerers as an inconvenience. To Ghetto, protecting them was actually a privilege. The thing is that every event that comes next consistently challenges these beliefs and eventually brings him to a breaking point where he has to decide if this is truly how he feels about the weak aka non-sorcerers. After successfully protecting and transporting Riko Amanai to Jujutsu Highway Gojo, he and everyone else thinks that the hard part is finally over. This is until Toji comes in and completely wreaks havoc. Toji as a character is someone who deserves an entire video on his own, but to not get sidetracked, I think it's at least worth explaining his importance to Ghetto's character arc outside of the obvious. After defeating Gojo, Toji goes on to take out Riko right in front of Ghetto just after she decided she wanted to live freely as her own person and not go through with the merger with Tengen. Ghetto actually offered this option to Riko, perfectly displaying his belief in protecting the weak as he gave her the option of choosing her own destiny and even offered to deal with the repercussions for her. The strong was offering to protect the weak. It was as simple as that. So Toji taking out Amanai not only ended her life, it also ended the black and white ideology that Ghetto had, especially considering the reason why Toji did this in the first place. A non-sorcerer had ruined their plans, and weak non-sorcerers were the ones that hired him to do so. Toji was the embodiment of all the ugliness and disgust that Ghetto would eventually feel towards non-sorcerers. Ghetto goes on to fight Toji and lose, and then Toji himself gets defeated by the newly awakened and Gojo. After this, Ghetto gets healed up by Shoko and makes his way to where the Time Vessel Association was holding Riko's body. He's absolutely shocked to find that Gojo is not only alive, but he's already recovered her body. In what must have felt like a fever dream to him, the room that he entered was engulfed in blinding white walls and garments, being worn by the seemingly brainwashed association members. To add insult to injury, they seem to be clapping with haunting smiles on their faces, disgustingly applauding the end of a young girl. This 
is technically who he's fighting to protect. This is the thought that must have ran through his mind at that moment. Displaying his still strong yet wavering convictions, even after Gojo asks Ghetto if he wishes to get rid of all the clapping people, Ghetto refuses, citing that it would be pointless since the ones that are truly responsible have long fled. This is when Gojo asks a question that in my opinion, truly kickstarts Ghetto's spiral into madness. He simply asks him, does there really have to be a point? In the midst of the deafening applause, Ghetto responds by saying, of course, it's important, especially as Jujutsu Sorcerers. This was Ghetto's final attempt at justifying the path that he was walking down as a savior of the weak, something that would later weigh on his shoulders heavily for the next year. After these events, Gojo was off doing missions on his own, leaving Ghetto to do the same. Considering it was a particularly busy summer with curse attacks, Ghetto's crumbling conviction along with the isolation of going on these long missions on his own slowly began to overwhelm him. His curse technique requires him to absorb curses by turning them into a large marble that he then swallows. As he describes it, the taste of a curse is like if you swallowed a rag covered in vomit and shit. Imagine doing this over and over again, every single day, all while questioning if the people you're doing this for are even deserving of it. To him, he was willingly swallowing vomit and shit for people like the ones at the Time Vessel Association that one day. People that would happily applaud the death of an innocent girl. He's suffering for those disgusting people. A thought that ate away at him every single day until it finally boiled over one day when he was in the shower. This scene is actually one of the subtle moments that puts Ghetto's complexity as a character on full display. Despite his heavy depression and resentment, he's still fighting to hang on to his kind-hearted duties as a sorcerer. Protect the weak at all costs. Don't lose your conviction, he thinks. This is when he mutters the word monkeys for the first time. Sarame. Hello, monkeys! The first time that he refers to non-sorcerers in a way that makes them less than human in his eyes. Later, he's greeted by Yu Haibara, a happy-spirited person that exemplifies everything that Ghetto originally thought that a sorcerer should be. For that reason, he questions Yu whether he's okay with being a sorcerer, even if it means putting himself in dangers that he might not be able to overcome. Being the simple-minded guy that he is, Yu simply responds by telling Ghetto that he just feels good working towards something that he knows he has the power to do, which is to help people. Ghetto is taken aback by this answer, and the actual importance of this conversation doesn't get revealed until a little bit later. Before the conversation goes on, Yuki Sakumo, a special great sorcerer, appears and has a sit down with him. The conversation that they go on to have sets the foundation for everything that Ghetto does next. Yuki reveals that it's possible for curses to stop existing entirely. This is because curses are created from the cursed energy that flows out of regular humans uncontrollably, essentially giving cursed spirits the fuel that they need to be born and gain strength. Sorcerers, on the other hand, know how to control the wells of cursed energy that they have and therefore don't provide this fuel for the curses. Her two main solutions for this is either to eliminate cursed energy altogether or teach humans how to control their own cursed energy in order to not have it flow out of them so freely. She's more inclined to go with option two, which would turn every human into a jujitsu sorcerer. As the applause from the group of people that fateful day grows louder and louder in his head, he expresses a third option, killing all non-sorcerers. If all non-sorcerers are purged from the planet, then cursed spirits will cease to exist. Although not disagreeing with the viability of this idea, Yuki asks Ghetto if he hates non-sorcerers. This is the first time that Ghetto fully expresses the opposing feelings fighting inside of him over the past year. He responds by saying that he doesn't know, because he used to think that a sorcerer's duty was to protect non-sorcerers but recently, he's been doubting if they're even worth fighting for. In his own words, the preciousness of the weak, the ugliness of the weak, I can no longer tell the difference between the two or accept it. The part of me that looks down on non-sorcerers, the part of me that tries to resist that feeling. If being a jujitsu sorcerer is like running a marathon, then the finish line is much too unclear. I don't know which are my true feelings. He's essentially pointing out that the endearment towards non-sorcerers for being so weak has slowly been becoming just straight up disgust towards them. The key thing to acknowledge here is that in either case, it seems like Ghetto's views towards non-sorcerers has always been condescending to an extent. He has always been fully aware that non-sorcerers were weaker than him, and his self-righteousness and self-imposed duty to protect them for the greater good were the only aspects of himself that he was truly conflicted with. That's why when Yuki points out that he's still at a crossroads to decide his true feelings, she only points out looking down on non-sorcerers and resenting that feeling as his only two options.
Mexicans. There was never an option of not looking down on non-sorcerers. That was just never an option for Ghetto. Ghetto had always looked down on them in a sense, but it was always through the lens of somebody that was aware of his own strength and the duties that he had to protect them. Now that this conviction was all but destroyed, he was left to face his true opinion on non-sorcerers and make the choice on whether or not continuing to protect them was truly what he wanted. Well, in a way, his decision was made for him after he had to deal with another death, this time with Yu Haibara, who had succumbed to a strong cursed spirit. As he was hovering over his lifeless body, he wondered if at the end of the road he was currently following, he'd only be met with a pile of his comrades' corpses. Things were only made worse for him now knowing that the weakness of non-sorcerers is what's creating these monsters that are killing his comrades to begin with. At this moment, he realizes how truly pointless his efforts to protect the weak really are. All they're doing is causing the problem and even resenting people that are trying to solve this problem like the ones that were applauding Rico's death. In what became the pivotal night that fully transformed Ghetto into a monster, he later went on a mission to take out a spirit that was terrorizing a small village. On this mission, he stumbles across two young girls that were beaten and caged up for essentially being sorcerers because the people of the village thought that they were witches of some kind. They put the blame of the spirit on the young girls, when ironically, it was their own lack of control of their cursed energy that was likely the real problem. In this moment, Ghetto thinks to what Yuki said, that he must choose what his true feelings are for himself, and he finally makes his decision. He then goes on to brutally massacre the entire village, totaling 112 people, clearly showing that the feeling he chose is this one. He hates non-sorcerers. After Gojo catches wind of this and even finds out that Ghetto had gotten rid of his own parents, he ends up confronting him and this is where we get a taste of Ghetto's newly realized goals and views. Ghetto now wants to create a world of only sorcerers, meaning that he intends to kill every non-sorcerer on the planet. The fact that even his parents wouldn't be an exception to this plan once again shows Ghetto's strong conviction as a person, for better or worse. Gojo lashes at him, asking what happened to thinking that pointless killing was useless, to which Ghetto responds by saying that there is very much a point to what he's doing now. He pretty much tells Gojo that he's made a decision, and he's going to follow his plan through to the best abilities that he can. His killing has intent now, that's the only difference. In his own words, this is the life I've chosen, all I can do now is give it all I've got. Calling back to a similar thing that Yu Haibara said, when he told Ghetto that he's just happy knowing he's working towards something to the best of his abilities. That's essentially all Ghetto is doing. His experience with Toji and Rico put a curse on him in a sense, a curse that forced him to truly reflect on what is actually giving his life meaning. Once he finally decided to let go of the self-hatred he felt from expressing his true feelings, a deep hatred for non-sorcerers, he was finally set free in his eyes. All he does from that point on is attempt to fulfill his goals to the best of his abilities for the good of his fellow sorcerers, so that none of them have to die pointlessly ever again. Ghetto is a truly tragic character, especially considering where he began and where he finally met his end in the story. Whether it was a good-hearted sorcerer fighting for the weak or an evil cult leader trying to exterminate them, Ghetto's always simply been doing what he feels was the right thing to do. It's not just a case of a villain doing things for the sake of being evil. His story is truly one that I don't think anybody could experience without taking a moment to themselves to really reflect on whether they would honestly blame him for taking the path that he did. Like I said at the top of this video, I think that this is something that truly makes Ghetto a timeless character and a perfect example of someone whose complex journey deserves to be appreciated for what it is. In the end, Ghetto is simply just someone trying to chase their dreams to the best of their ability. Nothing more, nothing less.